Welcome to Trophy Kids presented by Bad News Media. It is the college football show week eight edition. We are powering through this season right now. Um, got some really great games on deck. The week eight slate, you know, coming into the season, we were all kind of very hyped up for that week seven slate. We identified it right off the bat as well. That could be a really good weekend. But it was that week eight slate right after week seven that had some very intriguing matchups. Obviously, the big one going to be Georgia, Texas, which I will get to here during this program. Before we do that, though, just got a little house cleaning to get to here as always holding ourselves accountable from a betting standpoint and had a pretty decent weekend three one and one on the weekend that moves us to 25 one and two two pushes so far this season not great you know you want those in the win column but hey at least you're getting your money back on that nice little push uh positive so far on the college football slate nice 54.3 five percent uh make sure you're following at trophy kids pod on instagram twitter tiktok make sure you're following myself the trophy kid uh to make sure you're getting additional betting content as well as what will be given out on this show now Let's talk a little rankings heading into the week eight slate. Not a ton of movement, as you'll see. Texas still remains the number one team on my uh, rankings. I think they're the most complete team in football. That theory will be put to the test this weekend. Oregon moving into that two spot after a fantastic win against Ohio State. Ohio State only dropping to the three spot. Now, you might be going, whoa, whoa, whoa. why is Penn State not there? Look, I take the 12 best teams are what I think are the 12 best teams. And then I sort of power rank them against each other. I don't think Penn State beats Ohio State on a neutral field. But here's the great news. They're going to get to sort that out here uh, coming down the road. We'll get a nice game there. Georgia is at my five spot. Clemson remains at six ahead of Miami. Talked about it last week as to why I think that is the case. I think Clemson is the more complete football team right now, both defensively and offensively. I really like the way the Clemson offense has progressed post that Georgia game. I thought that they were going to have a chance to do so because I like Matt Luke, the offensive line coach. I thought that offense the line would get better as a unit as the season went on. They have shown improvement there. Kate Klubnick is looking more comfortable in the offense with his new weapons that are really nice. Is Clemson a national championship contender? No, I don't necessarily think so. We saw that against Georgia, but are they the best team in the ACC? Yeah, I think so, and I think they're probably better than the teams below them on this ranking. LSU moves into eight, has another opportunity this weekend to improve on that ranking. Alabama, Tennessee going to sort things out at the nine and eight spot. And then Iowa State and BYU wrap up that top 12. All right. With house cleaning taken care of there, let's talk about the week eight slate of college football games. We got a nice one on deck here, starting with Oregon versus Purdue. Line is at 30 over under 61 and a half at the time of recording. And oh, man, West Lafayette on a Friday night. Strange things happen there sometimes. Now, the stats that are going around in previous years or a big attribution to Jeff Brom. And I'll talk about that when we talk about Miami Louisville here uh, in a moment, he went three and one against top five teams at his time at Purdue. Absolute giant killer. Uh, but, Oregon's coming off a massive win against Ohio State. Very emotional win. You're then heading to the middle part of the country on a short week, Friday night, West Lafayette, a Purdue Boilermaker team who, in my opinion, is arguably one of the worst power four teams in the country. They're the worst team in the Big Ten, I think, for sure. There's an argument that they may be the worst in the power four. Uh, but they make a switch at quarterback last week. In Ryan Brown, I, hopefully I said your last name there correctly, Absolutely showed some signs of life for this Purdue offense. He went for uh, 18 for 27, 297 yards, three touchdowns, rushed for 118 on 17 carries. That's the type of quarterback, the chaos type of maker you need to, to maybe cover this spread. I don't think they're beating Oregon. Um, that would be absolutely insane. One of the biggest upsets, I think, in college football history as a 30-point underdog, maybe. Um, but Oregon's got to be a little careful here. We have seen teams now, you know, Kids have access to more money than they've ever had. Um, partying happens after big time wins. Refocusing and recalibrating can be a little bit harder for the college football athlete compared to the NFL. So this is one of those danger spots. I don't think Oregon's in fear of losing this game, but Purdue on a, a cover there might be something that is a little interesting at 30. All right, let's talk into let's move to a game where I actually have some opinions and thoughts and we can get deep dive into Miami Louisville line is at five over under 60 and a half. Jeff Brom, the giant killer, like I just said, his time at Purdue, he was fantastic against top tier teams in college football, three and one 
against top five teams, had a winning record against top 10 teams as the Purdue Boilermakers head coach, one of the hardest programs in the country to win at. He's been absolutely fantastic when an underdog going against a top tier team. And that's what he's got in Miami coming down the pipeline. Cam Ward and this Miami offense and defense have big aspirations this season for what they want to be here. So let's talk some matchups. I think the the offense of Louisville versus this defense is it Miami defense is a very interesting matchup because we know Jeff Brom can be very creative as a play caller. We also have seen this Miami defense be really fantastic down to down, but they have been letting up some explosive. Now, why is that happening? In my opinion, I think they do a fantastic job of being aggressive defensively. They do a great job of getting pressure. Um, They, they, do a fantastic job of stuffing runs at the line. 17th in stuff rate right now. Number one uh, in pressure rate, which is absolutely fantastic for them. But the explosive play, they're 124th for explosive plays on defense. That is not great for Miami. They it, they can be somewhat over-aggressive at times, and that's something where Jeff Brown might be able to catch them off balance with this Louisville offense. Now, we flip the side here. Louisville's... Passing attack has been suspect, to say the least. Uh, 79th in EPA per drop back. They're solid against the run. This is a game where Cam Ward and this Miami offense ha- have to be on their P's and Q's. They got to be able to take advantage of this weak secondary for Louisville. We've seen Cam Ward have a little high oopsie-daisy kind of factor um, to his game. Ben Part of his game, we saw it in the Cal game. We saw it in the Florida game. We've seen it in virtually every game where they play a team with a pulse. He has some type of silly turnover. You got to start to limit that here, I think, because you do not want to give this Louisville offense more cracks at it with short fields. That is not going to be a recipe for success for this Miami team. So they have got to be on their P's and Q's here. They've got to make sure um, that they are sustaining drives um, and being efficient with the football. I think the other thing here is this Louisville offensive line uh, played pretty well against Notre Dame. So it's going to be a very interesting game within the game to see what this Miami defensive line can produce against an offensive line that I thought played pretty well. And they're going to have to play really well here to give Talia Shuck time in the pocket to make some big plays down the field. From there, move on to Nebraska versus Indiana. Line is at six and a half over under 49 and a half. We've got a nice matchup here for the Big Ten. Look, this is an interesting one because Indiana is obviously on a roll. Kirk Signetti's done a fantastic job of getting this program on track. He is winning football games. That is what he does. When he took this job, he says, I win. Google me. And he's done absolutely that at this point in time. But you were running up against a Nebraska team that is also a hard news football team. I think there are some matchups that are going to be really interesting here. For Indiana, you know, how does that interior part of that offensive line handle the beef that Nebraska brings in Polar Bear Nash um, and Ty Robinson? Like, that's a lot of beef to try to block on the interior part of that defense line. Also, Nebraska's defense, getting Tommy Hill back in their secondary is absolutely huge for them. For an Indiana team who's been able to move the ball efficiently and effectively through the air, limiting turnovers, like getting Tommy Hill is going to be a nice get back for them. Nebraska's offense is going to be the interesting dynamic here. You know, Dylan Riola, fantastic freshman quarterback, has shown freshman moments at times, has gotten a little kind of careless with his drop back, his footwork. And sometimes he just kind of lobs it up there. Um, It's sort of like the lazy approach. We've seen some of these younger quarterbacks in an effort to mimic Patrick Mahomes um, has kind of infiltrated the college football game. Be interesting to see what they do here. They have a size advantage on the outside. Nebraska's wide receivers versus Indiana secondary. Like there is a size advantage here. So in short field positions, Nebraska's offense has an advantage, I think, against this Indiana uh, defense. That is why I am going Nebraska at plus six and a half. I'd love it at a seven, but, you know, we're going to be at plus six and a half. South Carolina versus Oklahoma. I don't have a ton to talk about in this game. I did take South Carolina at plus one and a half. The evaluation is sort of a quick one here. The Oklahoma offensive line is beaten battered. The wide receiving core beaten and battered. I mean, they were down their top, what, five wide receivers in that Texas game. They're getting a little bit healthier, but you're facing a South Carolina defensive front that just gets after you. They apply pressure. I think there's probably a chance that this game is incredibly low scoring, um, but I do think South Carolina has a couple more weapons to go ahead and 
and get this one across the finish line. Let's talk about one of the big matchups of the weekend. Bama versus Tennessee. Line is at three over under 56 and a half. This game is at Tennessee and it is vastly important for the SEC race. Um, you want to talk about two teams that need to get right on certain sides of the football. You have the Tennessee offense needing to get right against a weak Alabama secondary and defense. You need an Alabama defense to get right against a, a offense that is struggling. Why is the Tennessee offense struggling at this point? Right. I think it's a, it's twofold. First, the offense line has not been great. Um, they're too deep was really shallow. It, there wasn't a lot of room to sustain some injuries. The tackle play has been really bad. I think on this Tennessee offensive line, it has not looked good. And that is hurting Nico, who is a, you know, young quarterback still getting his feet under him in college football has a ton of talent. I think he will be really good in this system. But the other part I think here too, is like Tennessee doesn't have that wide receiver that can just take the top off. Like they had in the past, like there is no Hyatt on this team. And I think that's hurting the offensive philosophy that hypo wants to run. They've been very good running the football here. Nico, I think because of some of the offensive line struggles, because of his inexperience and the wide receivers that they have this year, I think there's slight hesitation. Like he's just not out there ripping it. He doesn't see it and rip it. You know, he's a little bit more hesitant to what he's seeing and maybe not trusting it as much as the opinion I get watching him. And so that ball is in his hands just a split second longer. And because the offensive line is not as great. It's causing the timing isn't there. That's needed in this hypo offense, essentially is what I'm trying to say. So can they get better on that front? Then you have this Alabama offense versus this really good Tennessee defense, two fantastic matchups right here. An explosive Alabama offense, Kalen DeBoer, you know, not a perfect coach, but really great on the offensive side of the football. It's weird having this team. It's a weird dynamic between Alabama and Tennessee this year because when you think of Alabama, you think really great defense. And this year, the defense is struggling and the offense is really great. And when you think of Tennessee, you think of really good offense, not so great defense. Well, the defense is sort of what's anchoring them right now and holding them down. And the offense is struggling. These teams have sort of flip-flopped in what their identity has been in the past. Tennessee's defensive line has to get after it here, I think, and, and control and try to contain Jalen Milrow because I think they're going to try to run him. The And I apologize if I mispronounce your name here. Philly, Philly, the linebacker for Tennessee, being out is a huge miss. Leading tackler. He's also the green dot for them. So he's sort of the quarterback of the defense, gets the calls in, gets make sure everybody's lined up. That's a massive injury here when you're especially going to have to try to spy Jalen Milrow and kind of track him down. Um, So we'll see. But this Tennessee defense, the secondary has definitely been the point of sort of maybe Achilles heel weakness. They're going to get tested here for sure. Um, They got to get after it though, but they're top five in yards per play, yards per game, points per Per game, all in the top five. Number one in EPA per rush. Number two in defensive success rate. They've been really good on third and fourth down. It's just that passing game and making sure they don't give up big explosives to this Alabama offense that does get rolling. Um, with it being at home, I do sort of favor Tennessee a little bit here. I haven't made a play just yet on the side. I have made it on the total. I went over Alabama uh, Tennessee game on the total. It's currently sitting at 57. So that's the number we're going to use for this. I think that offensively, Alabama is going to be able to move the rock against this Tennessee defense. And I think Tennessee's offense is going to get a little bit right here. I think Nico is going to have a little bit of a better game. I don't trust that Alabama defense yet. The, the youth in that secondary scares me. They're not able to kind of get on the same page here. They have some pretty bad breakdowns and communication. So Give me the over in this game. Sorry there, folks. Having a little te technical difficulties. All right. Let's talk Michigan, Illinois. Line is at four over under 44 and a half. What a fantastic matchup this is going to be. Give me Illinois in this matchup. I think that the Luke Altmeyer, uh, Bryant Franklin duo at wide receiver is going to be a little bit too much for this Michigan defense to handle at this point. Um, I think that when we look at this, obviously Johnson's a stud for Michigan, but this secondary has been left unprotected and the coaching has been a little bit poor. Like we've seen a big coaching downgrade on this Michigan staff. I was not a fan of the Wink Martindale hire at the preseason. I talked about it. Like he has got one pitch and it is a fastball down the middle. This man is just blitz boy central. And it leaves this secondary exposed who really outside of Johnson is struggling to find 
sort of good talent and a rhythm and a rhyme right now. And you're going up against Brian and Franklin, who are a dynamic one, two punch. Like, I think you can eliminate one, but you can't eliminate the other. I think they're going to eliminate Bryant with Johnson. And then you're going to have Franklin run in underneath. And Luke Altmaier has been really comfortable in this offense. He's done a good job not turning over the football. Michigan's defensive line is going to have to get after this Illinois offensive line, who has been playing a little bit down. Brent Bielema does a great job with his offensive lines. Um, but the last couple of games, they've been a little bit more shaky. So that'll be a dynamic to look after here. And then offensively, the Purdue game doesn't worry me as much for Illinois because you had this new quarterback come out in that game, run a completely different thing than you're prepared of, being a dynamic dual threat quarterback. Michigan does not have that. Their offensive line is not as good as we sort of expected it could be coming into this season. They've had some issues there. They don't really have any pass catchers outside of Loveland, the tight end. They're moving to Tuttle, who showed signs of life in this offense. Go figure. You're able to pass the ball more than five yards. Your offense has a little bit more life to it. But I do wonder if like the Alec Orgy effect might be a little bit more useful here in this game, given what Illinois had to deal with last week. Um, because you're having that, you got to be able to run the ball, which is the 10 man type of situation, as opposed to the 11 man, when you have the, the mobile quarterback Tuttle's just not as mobile. It, I just like Illinois in this spot. Like give me Illinois at plus four. Um, LSU versus Arkansas, absolutely fantastic. I told you coming into the season that I loved this Arkansas team. I thought they were going to be a lot of fun to watch. They've absolutely been that, but the area I did not expect them to be as good in was the defensive side of the football. You want to talk about a defensive coordinator that is making a name for himself. Travis Williams at Arkansas has done a fantastic job um, keeping this defense fresh, showing new looks depending on what they're expecting week to week. Like He's been really flexible in his defensive schemes. I thought that's been really fantastic. They're doing a really good job of containing the rush to here, um, which is going to be important. Now, LSU offensive line, I came into the season thinking they were going to be the best offensive line in college. They have been fantastic in pass coverage, but they have been struggling in run blocking. And that, I think that can be somewhat attributed to the fact that they made a scheme uh, shift to more of the zone uh, run blocking offense. They are 71 in offensive line yards created. Um, that is not great. Going against an Arkansas defense, 40th and second level line yards, which means they're doing a good job of preventing linebacker or run game from getting to second level there up front. So not fantastic, but hey, top 40, not bad in college football here against an offensive line that is struggling to, to generate good lanes for the running backs to take advantage of here and get to that second level. So that'll be an interesting dynamic to take advantage of and look at in this game, a game within the game. Garrett Nussmeyer, I think, has been fantastic at eluding pressure, resetting his, his feet and delivering a good ball at times. Uh, we saw that last week in the old Miss game. There was a handful of plays where you go, man, that was some really smooth operation within the a collapsing pocket to reach realign yourself, reset the feet, and deliver an accurate football. I like the way he's been doing that there. But Taylor Green, his health is the concern for this one. Now, they say he's going to go. I would have liked a little bit more confidence in Sam Pittman this weekend and his press conferences around Taylor Green's health. But Taylor Green was the reason I thought this Arkansas team could be a ton of fun to watch. And that Bobby Petrino power rush, kind of power spread offense, was going to be absolutely electric. Taylor Green is a dual threat quarterback. He is a chaos king, though. Like there, the, the bad Taylor Green is not going to be great. You need good Taylor Green here. Um, but I think Arkansas can hold tough in this game and, and and give them a good one. All right, let's talk about the game that everybody came here to talk about: Georgia versus Texas. Line is at five over under fifty seven and a half. And if Texas wins this game, the talking points are all going to be about has the changing of the guard happened. Is Texas now the new program in the SEC to watch? And is Kirby's Georgia starting to decline? I think that'll be a little premature, but I understand why the conversations will be happening when we see what's kind of been transpiring at Georgia this year. But what are these matchups going to look like? How are they going to perform? That's what we want to dig into. That's what we're going to get to here. And I think the first thing we're going to look at is this Georgia offense versus this Texas defense. Man, this Georgia offense has been off like a herd of turtles to start games. I mean, it has been. You look at these, like the three biggest games so far on their schedule, Clemson, Kentucky, Alabama. Zero combined points in the first quarter. They have struggled early in games with down-to-down -down success, which is a little bit concerning. I think Mike Bobo's script has not been what you would want it to be. Um, it, and that speaks to, like, what is the preparation looking like 
in the week during the week leading into these games because in the early part of the game your script is kind of supposed to be good like we saw that with Todd Munkin like he this Georgia team usually had a pretty good like coming out part now give credit to Georgia's coaching staff they have done a fantastic job of making in-game adjustments the players and coaches have done a good job of identifying games within the game where they can take advantage of the opposing team we saw it in the Clemson game we saw it in the Alabama game We've seen it with this team that they come out in the second half and the offense looks better. The defense looks better. They're doing things different schematically. And from a play calling standpoint, that allows them to perform better in second halves. I don't know if they can afford to do that, though, in this game against Texas. Um, Texas has been been an interesting group defensively this year because I think that Texas is the most complete team in college football. That's not saying a ton this year. There's no like really elite team, but I think Texas is probably the cut above everybody else right now. That's the way I see it. But we're going to get a, a really good data point for this Texas defense because Carson Beck is starting to spin the ball. Like he's starting to grip it and rip it like we thought he could and what NFL executives and scouts were so excited about with him. He has looked good in the last couple of weeks. He's had some spectacular ball placement. He's going to test this Texas secondary. That was a problem last year. Now, I think the secondary is improved. I like the talent in the room. I think the Texas defense as a whole has been playing faster this season, which is good. That means they're comfortable within the system. I think the area that you might be concerned about is, you know, one, how good is this secondary? But two, this defense online. Now, they have been good, but we saw, for example, in the Colorado State game, getting to the second level was a little bit easier than it should have been for that running back. Can Georgia's interior part of their offensive line take advantage of Texas's interior part of the its defensive line and give ATN some space to maneuver and to get to that second level and try to attack this Texas linebacking core. That's going to be sort of a game within the game that I think could have a major impact for Georgia. Now, when we flip the sides, Georgia fans got on me when I said, I thought this defense was sort of a year away from being that elite defense that we're so used to with Georgia, that they might struggle this season because they're going to rely on a lot of young guys in the secondary that I wasn't, even though the linebacking room was ultra talented, I wasn't sure if it, if it was going to be in place to really be a strong point in an anchorage for this Georgia team. Like it has been in the past defensive line wise, there wasn't that elite jump off the page at you sort of interior defense alignment, still a really good defense. I thought talent wise, but just not to the standard of Georgia. And I thought next year, based on the young guys they had on the roster and the profile of the coaching staff, that they would be an elite defense next year, but a year away, Georgia fans got all over me. Well, this Georgia defense has certainly been struggling. 96th in EPA per dropback, 41st in success rate, 27th in stuff rate, 57th in yards uh, yards per play, 21st in points allowed per game. That is not a stereotypical Georgia defense, and that's sort of what I was talking about. It's still good defense, I think, but not your stereotypical Georgia defense. And now they've got a massive test against this Texas team that – I think is the best offensive line in college football. We've gotten two good data points in the Michigan and Oklahoma game. I thought about this offensive line. Banks is holding on to that edge. He is such a phenomenal player. But this offensive line, I think, is number one in the country. I think they're going to win the Joe Moore Award. Be interesting to see how they handle this Georgia defense. Isaiah Bond's injury is going to be an interesting one to watch and how that could potentially hurt them. It's great that Quentin Ewers was able to come back last week. We saw him a little rusty in the Oklahoma game to start, but then that offense started to get rolling and they turned that defense into Swiss cheese. The running back room sustained an injury for the season. Questioning the depth. They've been really good, I thought, compared to expectations. They're starting to gain some confidence. I really like this team. I took Georgia earlier in the week at minus three and a half. The line is now at five. I'm not picking a side on this one. I am going to say over um, 57, I think, is pretty solid. So I'll go over on that one as well. Maybe lean Georgia. I might give out something extra, but I did take uh, Texas at minus three and a half earlier in the week. So with that said, in a couple of big game breakdowns, here are the bets for this week. Cincinnati minus five. Jeff Sims is the starting quarterback for Arizona State. Give me Cincinnati. Not only has Cincinnati been playing better, I thought, the last couple of weeks, but Anytime I have a chance to bet against Jeff Sims, I'm going to take it. South Carolina plus one and a half over under Tennessee, Alabama, Illinois plus four. I got Arkansas in uh, Kentucky against Florida there. I got Kentucky on the money line. Um, so that is what we've got so far. Uh, Texas, Georgia over and then 
I have minus three and a half, but that won't count for the show because I took it earlier in the week before we record. Um, as always, follow us at Trophy Kids Podcast on Instagram and Twitter uh, and TikTok to get any additional content. Hopefully you enjoy the show. Check out the NFL show with my co-host, Michael. And as always, peace. Thank you.